Welcome, everybody. We're so thrilled to see you all. And um, soon you're going to be hearing from our artist, Herb Snitzer. But I want to just say that it gives me great joy and pleasure to be the executive director of the Bremen. We're the Center for Jewish History, Culture, and Arts in Atlanta. So today's program is just one of many uh, arts and culture programs that we're presenting along with this exhibition. And we have a lot of exciting virtual programming along with the virtual posting of the exhibition itself. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Tony Casadante, but I want to give a shout out to Lumiere Gallery and uh, for helping us sponsor this exhibition. Thanks, Leslie. Um, just want to start by again thanking Leslie and the Bremen for all their efforts on this. This has really been a joy and an adventure putting on this this exhibition and they have made it just wonderful the whole way through. Leslie over there, David Shendwich and Cameron who's the MC staying on top of everything. Really appreciate all the efforts and also I'd like to thank Bob Yellowlease here at Lumiere for you know, all his part to to make everything happen as well. Anyway, um, I am going to start uh, my introduction and let me share my screen here. Again, this has just been a, a joy doing this. And okay, let me do my uh, introduction of Herb before I turn it over to Herb and, um, and start working through the presentation. Quick little background, you know, Herb Snitzer, uh, his parents were Jewish immigrants who fled the pogroms of Ukraine in 1905 as children. Both settled in Philadelphia where they met and married, and Herb was their second son born in 1932. Herb's father ran a small grocery store, and his family lived above it. Uh, a good student, Herb qualified for Central High School, uh, a rather prestigious public institution, finished high school there. After graduation, against the wishes of his parents, <laughs> Herb pursued art, and during his studies, uh, he was drafted into uh, the U.S. Army and served for two years before, you know, an honorable discharge and then returning home to finish his photography studies at the Philadelphia College of Art. Upon receiving that degree, he left for New York City to make his mark on the world, and he resided on the um, multicultural west side of Manhattan as he began his career as a photographer uh, he took to the streets to document his new world while pursuing the freelance work. That was 1957. A job that would alter the arc of his career uh, came to him in 1958, and it was a job to photograph jazz musician Lester Young at the Five Spot Cafe in the fall of 1958. The job was for Metronome Magazine, and it opened Herb's eyes to the world of jazz. He would soon obtain a permanent position as a photo editor until the sad demise of that publication in the very end of 1961. This job gave him access to some of the greatest jazz musicians of the time who played small clubs in New York. These intimate portraits brought him success both professionally and personally and comprised the core of the exhibition. After Metronome, Herb continued his photography career in New York, uh, working for Time Inc having work published in many publications, including Life, Look, Fortune, and many other publications of the day. One other notable distinction I just want to call out about Herb is that in the early 2000s, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the NAACP. And this was for his continuing uh, work to document social justice causes over the course of his entire career. Uh, with a lot of further ado, it's my honor to present uh, Herb Snitzer. The Louis Armstrong image is one of my favorite images and uh, I feel that uh, as a portrait it has held up after all these years. When I was at Metronome we were doing a trumpet issue and what I did was gather 22 jazz trumpet players to come together in New York City. Unfortunately, Lewis was out of town and Miles Davis wouldn't come. Otherwise, 22 wonderful jazz trumpet players enabled me to make the photograph because we did a uh, uh, Lewis was going to Tanglewood, Massachusetts, and I jumped on the bus to go with him. And while we were traveling north to Tanglewood, I made this photograph of 
Lewis, who was uh, really uh, such a wonderful person for me. I mean, I was very young and he knew this and treated me with great uh, respect as I did him, of course. He was just a wonderful human being. Herb, now uh, we noticed the Star of David uh, around uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong's neck. Uh, when you were taking the photograph, were you aware of that? And did that uh, call attention to it? And, and can you provide any backstory on, on that for yeah, us? Yeah, well, uh, when I was walking up and down the bus aisle, I came across Louis sitting there, uh, shirt open. It was, a, it was a hot summer day too, wasn't it? It was a hot summer day, of course, yeah. And, and everybody, no air conditioning in the buses then for uh, musicians and here was the greatest trumpet player there there was up to that point and the star David just showed on his chest and uh, it was given to him by the Karnofsky family. Karnofsky was a peddler but took Lewis under his wing and their wing as a family and made sure that he was fed and clothed and housed. And it was just a wonderful uh, moment for me when I came up upon this image of Lewis and I just started making photographs of him and with the Star of David. You know, many years later, I was always, uh, uh, conv I was convinced that Lewis always had a white bass player, Jack Leshberg, Mort Herbert, you know, and it was like his way of payback and a thank you. And uh, he, he was, Lewis Armstrong was a wonderful human being besides being one of the great trumpet players of all time. It was, it was quite a, uh, a moment for me. I'm gonna to go to a couple other images uh, covering the Louis Armstrong era. We see a six image of Velma Middleton from that same concert you were going to in Tanglewood, and then uh, Louis in front of his home. Um, any comments on these, Herb? Well, the thing about Louis standing in front of his house uh, in shorts and uh, plastic shoes I mean, it just, here, here he is, the most well-known entertainer in the entire world. And he was just relaxed and having a good time. And uh, this was in front of his house. And I love the address, 3456 107th Avenue, which is, I don't know whether you can see that in the, in the image, but. Uh, oh, it might uh, be covered up, yeah. It just, it just fit so well. The sad part about it is with Velma, she was a smoker and, uh, and very overweight and died of a heart attack uh, about six months later, which was really sad because, and here again, she, jazz musicians in those days were very tough characters in that they were able to sustain the bus rides and the uh, investigations by the police and uh, Lewis, Lewis just took it all in stride. He was just so wonderful. So that, that's about Lewis. I could go on and on. I mean, there's his band at Lewis Young Stadium in New York with Mort Herbert on bass and Danny Barcelona on drums and Billy Kyle on piano. And uh, it goes on and on. Trummy Young on trombone. Yeah. Anyway, okay. this, this was one of those wonderful moments of the, the entire band seen from the back. Um, and this image, Herb, this was from your first freelance assignment. Um, this is the first, the first negative I made on Lester Young, the very first negative. I just feel so blessed that I was able to capture something like this to have it last over 60 years. I mean, 
It, it, it was just the super image, and uh, I, Lester was just so wonderful and uh, very quiet, very introspective. A lot of people think that jazz musicians were all druggies, when in fact uh, it was the other way, <laughs> other way around, which uh, I, I really don't think I want to take it any further. So. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. And then here's a few more from that same evening of Lester Young. So really, because this was your first assignment, and then sadly, Lester Young passed away, this was probably your only, your only photographs of, of Lester, correct? Yeah, but, but I spent an evening with him at the village, not the village gate, at, at the five spot. And uh, I made quite a number of images, but these were the ones that sang to me. I mean, he was, you know, in a suit and a tie and a white shirt. Uh, I mean, musicians today just walk on stage with uh, who knows what they're going to wear. I want to jump from this to another subject that we highlight in the exhibition uh, pretty seriously is Nina Simone. And I'll just turn it over to you for this one, Herb. Yeah, well, this was a... She was, uh, or I was commissioned by Colpix Records, Columbia Pictures, to make a portrait of Nina Simone uh, for their album cover called The Amazing Nina Simone. So I like the one on the right where she's uh, just having a wonderful time. We both were having a wonderful time. We were about the same age and we had the same kind of sensibilities. It was really a lot of fun and Nina was in great shape. Just, just wonderful. But Colpix art directors bought the one of Nina in a quiet pose. I guess maybe it's because the, the name fit well on the jacket cover. <laughs> Who knows, but uh, Either one is uh, a very good uh, portrayal of uh, Nina. She went through a very difficult time, and uh, but I, I stayed with her and I uh, just uh, supported her and did whatever I could to keep her calm. That's that's me and, as I'm about 26. Yeah, and that's right. back, backstage at Town Hall. And that was a rather famous um, concert that I believe is still available as a record today. Oh, yeah, you can get Nina Simone albums. Uh, but I mean, this particular, problem. the Town Hall concert, I think, was, is, okay. you know, you can hear exactly what you heard that night. And then here's another one, a uh, couple other early images of Nina from the Village Gate. And then uh, later in your career, Herb, these are both from 1986. After the early period you had, uh, later in your career, you came back and then explored jazz a little bit more thoroughly. And uh, can you talk a little bit about your encounter with Nina in 86 and then how that led to kind of a late resurgence of your jazz work? Well, this, this image of Freddie Hubbard and Nina Simone was made about one o'clock in the morning. She, had, she was giving a concert at the Boston Symphony Hall. And when she walked out on stage, the entire, first of all, it was a sold out program and when she walked out on stage, the spotlight hit her and she came to the piano and, and just held on to it and uh, bowed. And she hadn't played a note yet, but everybody stood and cheered. I mean, it was just extraordinary. Yeah. And this, so after the concert, we were just playing around in the hotel room with all kinds of other people. And I just saw it as an opportunity to make a photograph of Nina where she's really happy and Freddie helped a great deal in uh, just loosening everybody up in the room. The one of her with this uh, wrap around her head was made in 
Bern, Switzerland. I went to Bern, Switzerland three years in a row, and one of the years she was uh, performing, and uh, that's how it all came about. I miss her still. I mean, people think she was very tough, which she was, and had a hell of a personal life. But uh, for me, she was uh, just a great performer and a wonderful person. I loved her. I thought she was just super. Okay, so let's go into some of the other jazz images. These are all featured in the exhibition. And, yeah, uh, well, that's... Uh, Wayne Shorter, who was part of the Art Blakey group, and that's Dizzy Gillespie with his horn up in the air. What's significant about my photographs, of, especially these two, but the one of Lester Young as well, is that I try to have my image full frame. You see the black line that goes around it. That's because of the film, film, remember film? <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in which uh, the image is a complete image, no cropping, no dodging, no anything but the image itself. And I saw this as a way of my work being seen in context to the era in which I was living. From a photographic standpoint, that black line represents uh, mid-century American photography. That's too complicated. I guess I'll start again, but let's go no, no, on. No, no. no, that's fine, Herb. I, I yeah. get totally what you mean. And then here's uh, an original image of John Coltrane and then some of your collage work later in your career. Yeah, well, this, is, this was the beginning of using my images in a more creative, not a better way, but just, just a, a message that comes across in a couple of ways. John as a wonderful tenor saxophone player and John as this reflective, quiet, person who had beaten the, the drug syndrome of, uh, of the day and was backstage at, and he was reading a book holding a saxophone in his right hand. I just saw it as just a wonderful, quiet image. And a few more here. Well, the classic monk with the glasses uh, reflecting uh, the keys of the piano made at the UN. In, in deference to the UN, Monk took off his Chinese hat, which he was wearing in those days. The one on the right is two o'clock in the morning. He, he, jazz musicians lived a, just a different kind of life. I mean, you know, you had breakfast at uh, six o'clock in the morning, but you were up all night. Well, anyway, this is uh, Duke Ellington with the same black line going around. And it was two o'clock in the morning uh, at the Columbia Recording Studios and the Duke's orchestra was uh, rehearsing. And I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't tell you what tunes they were <laughs> rehearsing. It's too, too long in the back, in back. But uh, uh, that's okay. Duke, Duke was just a wonderful guy. He, he was just a lot of fun. But when his orchestra started playing, there was no, no messing around. He really made sure that they knew what they were doing before he really put it all together. Yeah. I didn't have much to say to, to uh, Duke Ellington. I was more in awe of uh, who I considered the greatest American composer of the 20th century. It's a big, big, big idea, but that's how I feel about Duke. Yeah, very good. Um, and let's go on to another rather well-known personality, um, Miles Davis. 
Yeah, my early miles in 1960 was at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. And uh, a couple things stand out uh, with uh, Miles at the, uh, he, well, I, I, I want to give him his due. He was a wonderful, musician. But as Toscanini said about Wagner, as a composer, I take my hat off to him. As a person, I put it back on. He, he just didn't seem to understand that, that uh, music is made by lots of people. And he just went his own way, but in a difficult way. Nina Simone was happy. Miles seemed always unhappy. But yet he was a, a terrific uh, artist. This, was, this image was made in Newport, Rhode Island, Newport Jazz Festival. He had just finished a set and was standing in the doorway of his trailer. And uh, I just saw it as just a wonderful image of uh, Miles Davis with uh, his black skin, his black shirt, and his gold necklace mirroring his eyes. It just, uh, for me, it, it's, it's the classic Miles Davis. Meanwhile, you know, in, in photographing, uh, jazz musicians, that was one part of my life at that point. I was working for Life Magazine and Fortune Magazine. It, it really uh, was a different world. I mean, I was pho I photographed uh, Tennessee Williams for the New York Times, uh, Betty Davis for the New York Times, Ossie Davis, I mean, it went on and on. Let's jump back over here. And after you kind of coming back into the fold here, um, I pulled this one out particularly because Jimmy Heath sadly just recently passed away. Yeah, and, recently and, died, yeah. And, and he made his, his uh, later home here in Atlanta. So I just wanted to pull this one out. with a Yeah, this was a house that I owned in Elizabeth. Was that one in Maine? Was that when you were yeah, up in, in, in Maine? Maine. Yeah, in Maine. In yeah. Maine, yeah. 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 Well, it looks like a very quiet, intimate moment. So this was actually in your home? Yeah, yeah. And he picked up his uh, saxophone. So he was traveling there for, for jazz reasons to perform, but he was staying at your home just because you guys had had a history? Was that the backstory? Well, the backstory was we didn't have very much money and uh, Jimmy uh, needed a certain amount of money. And uh, so... Save some money by staying with you. That's yeah. right. Rather than putting him in a hotel, we just put him in an extra room that we had. So... Uh, totally understand. Which was great because here he is, you know, he's not just doing the gig and then leaving. I mean, he's just hung around. We had... Uh, dinner together and then uh, after the concert together it, it was a more human kind of uh, moment for me yeah. yeah well I'll make a photo reference here also Herb you're still doing the black line showing the full frame everything that you captured but your format has changed so this is a, a medium format probably a Hasselblad I would guess yeah, that's exactly what, what it was. And yeah. uh, it just seemed to fit more than 35 millimeter. Yeah. Uh, more rectangular. It just seems to work better as a square. You know, one of the things about photography, especially photography in those days, was it was a very physical thing as well. I mean, you know, these musicians are up late, and uh, which meant that I was up late. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a whole different way of living. You know, you, 
you get to work at uh, six, six o'clock in, at night and you go till three o'clock in the morning. I mean, and we'll go on to a couple other ones here. Um, and again, well, these Bobby McFerrin and uh, Buddy Guy, this is more pop jazz on the left and Buddy Guy on the right. Buddy, uh, this picture of Buddy I made in his club in Chicago. And it was the first time I had ever been to Chicago. And it was freezing cold, <laughs> so cold. And I had just a small jacket. I was on my way uh, to the airport and I just had to stop in at, a, at one of the hotels in, in, in the strip and uh, ordered a, uh, uh, the, the warmest drink they could give me, <laughs> which which was, and this was like at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it didn't stop me from drinking it. I was so cold. I'm not a very good uh, player for uh, for jazz at 10 o'clock in the morning, but I, uh, that came later. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the Bobby McFerrin, uh, that was kind of uh, where you make your 92 was when you moved to St. Petersburg. So that was... Yeah, yeah. That was a fundraiser for uh, the Florida Orchestra. And I had the opportunity to photograph uh, Isaac Stern, who was uh, also performing. It was it was like a love fest to get the Florida Orchestra into the black, and uh, it was it was quite an evening. Uh, and then I think we just have a few more here. Yeah, I, I was here. The black line is the around. around uh, Maxine. Maxine Weldon, but not about Vincent Gardner. So sometimes I just had to crop to make an image that really said something. And I just love this one of uh, Vincent and the one of Maxine. I mean, she was an unknown, unheralded player living on the West Coast. And yet she, she tore it up. She really, uh, from what I remember, she had one of the most exciting sets that I've ever been privy to. And, and that, again, was during that period, that three-year period when you were the official photographer for the Bern uh, Jazz Festival. 87. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's when I really got to see a number of players that I hadn't seen for many years. Joe Williams. Did many approach you and wonder where the heck he had been or? or uh, yeah, was a matter of fact, on that one? Uh, yeah, a, a number of them did, you know. They said, where have you been all these years? <laughs> I said, well, I've been out and doing other things and working more as a journalist. And, and here it is all these years later, the, the, the photographs hold up. Yeah, you're they just back. hold up. I love the one of Vincent with his one eye and uh, the uh, dark hole of the trombone. We're going to jump a little bit here, and I want to be uh, on top of time, and, and uh, I'm not sure if we're getting any comments or any, any questions at the end, but I do want to kind of leave a little bit of time for that. So we can go back to some of the jazz images if we need to, but I wanted to kind of... Um, also part of the exhibition, and I'm just gonna put on my curator's hat here and talk a little bit about this, is that concurrent to the jazz images you know, uh, or that Herb was known for, concurrently uh, human rights and street photography are always really part of, of his being. And through the years, you can see this image, the trio in New York City goes back to 1958. Herb, do you want to talk about uh, talk about this photograph or, or um, just that general topic, and then we can go through a few of these? Yeah, well, I've always been involved with equality and racial justice, and this this image just seemed to have that 
issue in the forefront. I was walking in Central Park and I came across these three kids who were just having a fun time. When they saw me, they started laughing and so on. So, and it turned out where, to me, it, it was a Hispanic kid, a white kid, a black kid, all together enjoying life. If only that could have kept on going, which it did because it, it was one of the precursors of uh, the civil rights movement. Yeah. And I just saw it as a way to show that it, things will change. Things will change. Yeah. See, we walked around New York. I walked around New York with my camera all the time. I always had it on my shoulders because uh, you never know when a photograph appears. And here it just, it just did. I yeah. mean, it wasn't that something I was thinking about. It just these three kids, and it came later that I realized what I had captured. And uh, Rossi Davis, very much involved with the uh, civil rights movement. This is a this is an older. I mean, uh, an image from a little bit later in your career in 1990, and I believe it was an assignment. And you had to go take his portrait. I'm not sure of the exact context, but I believe this was in his home, correct? In Ossie Davis's home, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I do, if you have a moment, I do want you to kind of tell uh, an earlier story about Ossie Davis. Maybe it might have been the first time you actually met him. Was that correct? The 1968 uh, at um, the um, backstage of the 100th celebration of the birthday of W. E. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, that that was part. This was later on, uh, 68, 69, I guess. And uh, I think it was 68. 68. We were yeah. backstage at Carnegie Hall. Uh, we were celebrating the uh, life of W. E. B. Du Bois, the black intellectual. This was in intermission. And I was backstage and I found myself standing next to James Baldwin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rostopovich, the great uh, jazz, uh, uh, classical cello player. And I didn't have a camera. And it was like one of those moments where you just wish time would stop and you would be able to re reconnect uh, and hold them all in, in, in place. But it was not to be. I didn't have my cameras at all. Well, but it was quite an experience to be backstage with James Baldwin and Dr. Martin Luther King, for sure. Wow. That, that, that is probably maybe because you didn't have a camera, it's burned more permanently in your brain, but. Uh, it is, <laughs> you, you certainly, you better believe it. You know, I keep thinking to myself, if only, but yeah. I figure there are others that were, uh, other images that I made, which will just have to be the ones that the public will see and, and uh, we did all right. And this, this is a, uh, another one that, it, is representational of both the human rights work and then some of your later collage work where you're pulling uh, all sorts of items together for this one. Uh, yeah, this is a little blown out. Uh, there's much more detail in the face of Rosa Parks. Well, we'll have to, let's, um, uh, I'll, well. No, there's nothing you can do about that because what I, I well, if you, no, you, you can't darken it because everything else will go away. But, but the, she's... That was her mugshot, right? The, fi the figure on the chair, on the stool, was John Hope Franklin, one of the first academic African-American teachers 
to come out of the civil rights movement. John was, was uh, just very quiet, but very influential in terms of the movement. And I had the opportunity to meet him in 1990, whatever it is. It might have and been 1998. Okay, uh, I'm sure it's on the piece itself. Yeah, and um, anyway, he was a rather uh, influential figure and... Uh, yeah, connected with uh, many years later, there's Rosa Parks who was jailed in uh, December 1, 1955 and John Hope Franklin uh, I think it's 2000 and well, I, I don't, you know the yeah. date, but, yeah. uh, and then the eagle flying above uh, Rosa Parks' head. It's a powerful image. Um, yeah. Herb, Herb um, I, and I'm going to kind of just ask you a question here. We haven't really gone through this, but the Rosa Parks did, you know, the musicians that you were covering through the late fifties and early sixties, I mean, did they feel an affinity to the regular people like Rosa Parks because they were kind of all in this struggle together? Was that kind of the really close tie? Because the musicians that you photographed, you know, they wanted to just be musicians, but we were all a people of our time and, and they really became a lot more symbolic in a lot of ways. Um, do you feel like the musicians of the day uh, looked at people like Rosa Parks and the con contributions they were making and feeling like, you know, it was all on the same team trying to move the ball forward? Yeah, well, it, it was a time of great uh, transformation in, in uh, American music and in American life. I mean, uh, John Hope Franklin, Dr. Alvin Poussaint, Dr. Randall Kennedy. I mean, these, these were the academics who were pre presenting images to the public, my images to the public. And uh, it was important to many of the jazz musicians who really, uh, uh, what I consider ta taking uh, a stand for civil rights. I mean, John Coltrane, Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, it, the list goes on and on of those wonderful musicians and singers and artists who uh, really were involved yeah. with, with uh, the civil rights movement. I mean, Max, Max Roach got arrested <laughs> They all got arrested one way or the other. I mean, it was really, a, you could make a comedy out of this. It'd be a Mel Brooks uh, comedy. Yeah. But a, anyway, there was a serious side to, to what these musicians, these, these were great artists who were relegated to the back of the bus yeah. when they were touring in the early 50s and uh, Herb, you had a, was extraordinary. You, you had a, um, and I think they all handled it with, you know, especially from your recounting, and I think history will prove that they handled it with incredible grace and humor at times. I know you had one story uh, and I don't have a picture for it. Now I'm kicking myself. I didn't put it in as the final slide, but you had one, was it, um, they were traveling through the South, was it Count? Basie, um, or was it Dizzy Gillespie? And he had a fez. Um, do you know the it story? Was Dizzy, it was Dizzy Gillespie, and they they were traveling by bus, and they somehow the the reservations were uh, confused, uh, but but uh, they still needed to go to sleep. They had just performed. A concert and uh, they were on the bus waiting to get into their hotel room but they they also knew that they were weren't uh, in North America they were in, <laughs> in, 
in the South, and it wasn't a pleasant time. And uh, Dizzy, they got to this hotel and uh, uh, they were ready to get off the bus knowing that they didn't have any reservations and they probably would not be welcome by the hotel. So Dizzy took out a red fez, you know, like you, you see it in movies uh, with this uh, red cover for the head. And he walks into the hotel and he gets to the, uh, to the concierge Front counter. And, and says, uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like certain number of rooms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the young kid, behind the desk said, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't serve African-Americans here. And Dizzy looked at him and put his hand to his chest as if he was just shocked and said, and, and said to this young kid, these aren't uh, uh, African-Americans, these are Africans. Can't you tell by the red fez that they wear? And the young kid said, oh, okay, I'll take you all in, which he did, which he did, and everybody had a good night's sleep. It was one of those idiotic kind of situations, like uh, trying to be human and, uh, and having to fight for their uh, right to have a hotel room. Amazing times that you, you have lived through, Herb. Um, this is, um, we have a few closing slides as we're kind of wrapping out. I really want to stay on top of the time and be respectful of everybody's times here. You know, I think it's interesting pulling the show together and, you know, her <coughs> I truly believe is, is really more relevant, as relevant today as, as when he was making it and maybe even more so. And, um, you know, again, um, there's one a small story I kind of want to say on myself and, um, uh, again, I didn't put a slide in for this, but um, please visit the Bremen's website. There is an interactive tour. Uh, the work is all physically up on the walls, and you can take the tour and experience, and uh, Leslie and everybody down there is working hard that, you know, possibly we'll actually be able to get in and see the exhibition. Um, one thing I do just want to talk about for a second is there are three images that finish off the civil rights section. And um, when I first was picking images for the show, I passed over these because they were protests of a uh, demonstrations that Herb covered in 1996 about a young African-American, um, may have been a teenager, I think he was only 18, uh, Tyron Lewis, who was um, stopped by the police. He was unarmed, and sadly, um, he uh, was shot and killed by the police that evening. And there were a lot of riots that ensued, and Herb, being Herb, was out in the streets um, photographing the protests that followed. And when I first looked at these images, I thought, well, we're focusing on jazz. This is a connection. I really don't uh, I, I think that will just seem like I'm grasping at, at uh, uh, sensationalism to include those. So I, I made the conscious choice to not choose those. And then George Floyd and the awakening that I think we all have been going through and the change that we're all feeling uh, about social justice in different contexts. And I called Herb and I said, Herb, take those three images, put them in a package and send them my way. Because I think it's even more relevant now that Herb is who he is and has lived the life that he has. And that was his part and parcel. There wasn't anything exploitive that Herb was doing with that. And I really felt like I needed to show his story and show those images and they, they would be seen for what, what they are. And it really wasn't sensationalism. So uh, those are included. They're part of the 3D tour, and let's hope we can get in and, and look around for those. Um, Herb, are there, as we're kind of wrapping up, um, are there any, um, any other kind of closing comments you want to make, or do we have questions? Um, 
Cameron, or people? So, uh, yeah, I have a few questions that came in that I have written down. Um, okay. So I can go ahead and get these out. So Lucius Smith asked, uh, how many frames did you take in this moment? And I believe that was back on the second slide. Oh, with uh, the Louis Armstrong image. Yes. Um, do, Herb, do you remember? I mean, do you feel like you got that one in one or two shots, or, or were you standing in front of Mr. Armstrong there for a while? Well, well, no, I was walking up and down the aisle, talking with the musicians. I have, seen, I have seen a second version of that, so I know you at least got two frames. Do you think it was just really two or three frames that you took? Yeah, that, that's it. It, it, it was, uh, it was, yeah, one, well, two or three images, no, no more than that, but... Uh, yeah. Because in, in, in those days, it, you know, you had uh, cameras that were not motor driven. So today you can go through 36 images. Well, today you wouldn't even have film. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, you know, people say, well, it was a lucky, lucky shot. Well, with all due respect, I guess I was just lucky all the time because I was able to, <laughs> to capture uh, the human spirit. Uh, one, one of the metaphors that I continue to feel up to these days now is uh, jazz is a, an original American art form. And in those days, the civil rights days, jazz musicians embodied everything that was wonderful and uh, scary. And, uh, but they, they pursued their art among, among a time when they were not really well known or well accepted. That came later. One of the characteristics of some of the photographs that I made, they all look tired. I mean, like, Louis Armstrong looks tired. Well, he was because he was constantly moving, constantly finding himself on the road. And uh, no longer is it that way, you know, if, if well, a, anyway, that, that opens up a whole other uh, view of, of the life of jazz musicians in America in circa 1950 on. It, 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 it really uh, um, was quite a period of time. Yeah. Cameron, any other questions? Absolutely. Give me one moment. So uh, another one from Lucius Smith was with you shooting film, what were some of the techniques you used with exposures or development to capture images in lowly lit venues? Well, that's a good well one. first of all, when, when it was very dark in, in clubs where jazz musicians were playing, is there was always these hot lights that they were playing under so that the musicians themselves were brightly lit. And uh, it was not as hard as it seemed, or at least it wasn't hard for me. I, I took to photography like a duck to water. And uh, uh, I used primarily Nikon equipment I'll give you a rundown of Nikon equipment, 35 millimeter. I used a 500C uh, Hasselblad and uh, interchangeable lenses with the Nikon camera. And uh, pretty much it. I didn't use flash until later when I was able to manipulate it in a, in a way that really did accentuate these uh, men and women. 
but it was a simple process for me. I, I didn't find myself needing or wanting to uh, have a great deal of equipment because I was traveling and uh, it became uh, just exhausting. I, I just really was able to uh, understand why jazz musicians were so tired because they were always on the road yeah. to make money so that they can feed their families. Um, well, I'm looking at the time and I do want to be, um, there's a few closing things I want to say, but it, was there anything else, Herb, um, that uh, uh, I feel like we've given people a good overview. Are there any points or anything you think we missed? That uh, No, that's fine. I, I appreciate what you've done, Tony. I appreciate the Bremen uh, folks supporting the exhibition. Uh, it's just wonderful. And uh, and uh, if you're in the Atlanta area, check it out. Yep. Um, I I'm putting up uh, the, the exhibition will be up until, um, uh, right now it's scheduled to be up till the end of the year. Again, we're, we're hoping, uh, Leslie's hoping and, and I am as well that We'll, we'll be able to get the physical facility and be able to safely and comfortably get people in to, to see the exhibition. But there is some additional programming. Uh, Herb, this might be news to you because you're not part of this program. I see you looking at the screen reading it. And this is the next one that we're going to do about your exhibition. And it's called Jews and Jazz, the discussion of the impact Jews have had on the jazz scene. So you have to put that on your calendar, Herb, and you can be an audience member for that one. Uh, maybe they'll call on you. But um, uh, Gary Motley and Dr. Gordon Vernick will be the presenters that evening, and that's October 15th. Uh, right. We do have one more on the books with you, Herb, on the 12th, where you'll be talking with jazz musicians. That The details of that programming are still formulating. That's November 12th, and that's with Joe Alterman, who's a very uh, distinguished jazz pianist here in Atlanta. And Herb, you and Joe will be involved in that one. Um, and there's, there's other additional ones that we have in the work. So keep checking the Bremen site. Um, make sure you get out there and uh, enjoy the 3D tour. Uh, there's a nice video, eight minute video of Herb um, out there and you can see Herb um, in his home and um, get a little bit more up close and personal with Herb. And I hope you enjoy all the um, assets that we have out there online for, for uh, everybody to enjoy. Uh, Leslie, uh, Cameron, David, any final comments? Thank you, Herb, so much. Tony and Herb, thank you very, very, very much for participating in this today. Really, really appreciate it. Well, well thank you very much for having me and uh, you know, if somebody wants to get in touch with me directly, it's Herb Snitzer at AOL.com. And I would welcome hearing from you. Thank you all. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Herb. Thank you. Bye-bye.